Thank you very much. I, I'd like to thank the committee members of the Physics Society for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd particularly like to thank Joanna Lada for her help in organizing this talk. Unfortunately, she can't be with us tonight. John Bell is famous, of course, for translating Landau's books, but he's much more famous for something else. He's famous because he produced the most single most important result in the foundations of quantum mechanics since the war, since the Second World War. And I want to say a little bit about his theorem. I want to say a little bit about how Bell arrived at his theorem, what the theorem means, and how Bell changed his views about the face of, lo of locality and non-locality in the course of his life. Of course, he died at the uh, he died at the age of 62 as a result of a brain hemorrhage, which was a great shock to the whole community. He was in the peak of his powers, but he'd already had enormous influence on the field of the foundations of quantum mechanics. Because of Bell's theorem, you might say that foundations of quantum mechanics went from being a topic discussed in philosophy department seminar rooms into mainstream physics because the predictions that he made were testable, and they were tested, and they've been tested over a period of, gosh, from the early 70s until now. The number of tests is innumerable, um, but this has put the foundations of quantum mechanics very much in mainstream physics. So let me say a little bit to start with about what Bell was doing in 1964, 1966, that led him to the Bell Theorem. There's an issue in the foundations of quantum mechanics that has to do with the existence of hidden variable theories. Is the wave function in quantum mechanics, the solution of the time-dependent and the time-independent Schrodinger equation, is the wave function a complete description of the system? I'll leave aside for the moment whether the wave function represents something real, the so-called ontic interpretation of the wave function, or whether the wave function represents, to some degree, our, our information about a system. Let's just ask ourselves the question, when we do quantum mechanics, if you specify the wave function, or if you like the abstract ket vector in the Hilbert space, representing a system, have you given all the relevant information that you possibly can give? about the state of that system. If you believe in hidden variables, the answer is no. The quantum mechanics state is not complete. There are other things, there are so-called hidden variables, other parameters that represent the system, aspects of the system, that are relevant to the behavior of the system. And the question is, can you have such things? Can you have well-defined hidden variable theories that supplement standard dynamics involving a wave function in quantum mechanics. In 1932, in, in John von Neumann's famous book on the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, which for the first time unified the matrix mechanics approach of, of Heisenberg and the wave mechanical approach of, of Schrodinger, unified them in the language of Hilbert spaces, von Neumann provided a little proof Quite a, it's a systematic, it's a rigorous little proof that hidden variables cannot exist. Unfortunately, hidden variables already existed. Louis de Broglie, in the late 20s, came up with a self-consistent hidden variable theory. It was widely criticized at the time, sometimes for the right, sometimes for the wrong reasons, but it put von Neumann's no hidden variable proof into a very awkward place. In 1952, David Bohm came up with essentially the same hidden variable theory, independently. After having written a textbook in 1951, and published a textbook called Quantum Theory, in which again, Bell had Bohm had provided a little no-go proof for hidden variables. It was a little bit more informal than von Neumann's proof. And within a year after publishing that book, Bohm realized he'd made a terrible mistake 
and came up with a, a ramified, well-defined hidden variable theory that was very, very close, if not identical, to the theory that de Broglie had come up with in the late 20s. Incidentally, these are two plaques that I found online that related to Bell himself. The first one, well, Bell was born here. Presumably this is over the house that Bell was born in in Belfast. Scientist, quantum mechanics, quantum theorem. The other plaque is at the Queen's University in Belfast, where Bell studied, did his undergraduate work. Bell, John Stuart Bell, FRS, physicist and philosopher. I wonder what he would have thought being described as a philosopher. But he was certainly, to my mind, a philosopher of physics. Well, Bell became extremely interested in the question of hidden variables. And now Bell, of course, was, he spent most of his career at CERN and he worked in the physics of particle accelerators. He and his wife were experts in the physics of particle accelerators, but as a kind of a hobby, Bell was very interested in the foundations of quantum mechanics, and in particular in the question of hidden variables. And he was outraged by the fact that there existed a well-known proof by the great John von Neumann, it's telling us that hidden variables don't exist, when at the same time there were self-consistent hidden variable theories. What was going on? So here's a picture of pictures of the Nobel Prize winner of 1929, the father of wave mechanics for matter, matter, uh, matter waves, of course, and David Bohm, who eventually became a professor at um, Birkbeck College in London, died in 1992. As they say, the author of a very good textbook on quantum mechanics, 1951, and the 1952, the author of uh, hidden variable theory. One of the interesting things about this hidden variable theory, by the way, is that we've learned through a number of results, including Bell's theorem, that there are properties of the, of the de broglie bohm theory that are characteristic of any conceivable hidden variable theory. There are certain characteristic properties that we now know have to hold for any hidden variable theory, any self-consistent hidden variable theory. So it is the paradigm hidden variable theory in that sense. And, of course, it's a theory in which you postulate the existence of point corpuscles over and above the wave function. So if we're thinking, for example, the famous two-slit experiment when we send particles through a diaphragm with two slits, one particle at a time, and we, we look at the evolution of the wave function, which passes through both slits and eventually gives rise to an interference pattern at the screen. In the de Broglie bone picture, you have the wave function, but you also have hypothetical, a hypothetical point corpuscle that's associated with the system. It has a well-defined trajectory that's determined by aspects of the wave function. And you can see that if the particle emerges from the top slit, for example, it's going to undergo a very kinky trajectory. And you'll see, so each one of these trajectories represents one of the particles coming through one at a time. And you can see the buildup of this familiar interference pattern. This is a, this is a period, of, I mean, a, a region of the screen of high intensity, with more particles coming through, a little bit less here, and so on. And look, any particle going through the top slit, for example, its trajectory will depend on whether the bottom slit is open. If the bottom slit is closed, the trajectory will be quite different. You won't get the standard interference pattern. How does it know the other slit is open? Because the wave function goes through both slits and it's acting on it. And indeed, there's a so-called guidance condition that says that the velocity of a particle is proportional to the gradient of the phase of the wave function where it is. So the wave function acts as a kind of guiding wave. It tells the particle how to move. And you'll notice, by the way, that there's an axis of symmetry here 
No particle goes, that's going through the top slit passes that axis of symmetry, and vice versa with the bottom slit. And that means that if you find a particle up here, for example, you know which slit it came from. And that is an absolute counterexample to the claim you often hear in the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics, that if you know the path, you don't, know the, you don't get interference. Well, here in this theory, you, 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 you can establish exactly what the path must have been, which slit the particle, which slit the particle went through, by where it, where it ends up on the screen. Of course, there's a sense in which the particles are hidden. And if you try to find them, you try to detect them between the diaphragm and the screen, you're going to upset the interference pattern, you're going to basically destroy it. So, let me just, let me just point out here, this is a self-consistent theory. There are well-defined equations for the motion of these corpuscles, the hypothetical corpuscles. So there is more in this theory than just the wave function. There's, the, there's these extra elements. Now, why would you believe in such a, th a theory? Well, because first of all, it gives you a picture that you wouldn't otherwise have. Is that a good argument? Probably not. But it's claimed to solve what's called a measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Well, I won't, I won't go into that now, but there are a number of redeeming features. There are also some very awkward features of this theory. Now, one of the very awkward features of this theory is that if you have two particles and the wave function of those two particles is entangled, which means you can't describe it as a product of a wave function for that particle and a wave function for that particle. In fact, it's going to be a linear combination of factorizable wave functions, so-called entangled states. Then it turns out that the behavior of one particle will depend on the instantaneous position of the other particle besides the influence of the, of the wave function. That's, action, that's instantaneous action at a distance, non-locality. Let me just repeat that. The position of a part, one particle, could be either one, in the case of an entangled wave function, will depend, amongst other things, on the exact position of the other particle, no matter how far away it is. That's instantaneous action at a distance. Now, we're used to instantaneous action at a distance in physics, if you think about something like Newtonian gravity. There you also have two gravitating bodies, like maybe two planets, or the planet and the sun. They act on each other instantaneously, producing mutual accelerations, etc. But the difference is the following. In Newtonian gravity, that interaction falls off with distance, inverse square law. But in the case of quantum mechanics, you can have entangled systems that are arbitrarily far apart, and that instantaneous action at a distance in the de Broglie bone picture does not die away the distance. Now, already you might be asking yourselves the following question, what about relativity theory? I mean, wasn't the whole point of general relativity an attempt to provide a theory of gravity that was consistent with relativity, that did not have instantaneous action at a distance? Why do we not like instantaneous action at a distance? because it's not Lorentz invariant. So, if for a particular inertial observer there's some kind of interaction that's instantaneous, for a moving observer that same interaction will no longer be seen to be instantaneous, it'll be retarded, because of the relativity of simultaneity, and that means that there's going to be a violation of the relativity principle. So, what's going on in the case of de Broglie Bohm? Well, at the level of the hidden variables, something very non-Lorentz covariant seems to be taking place. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Come back to that. But that's one of the key features of the de Broglie bone picture. It involves action at a distance when you have multiple particles that are entangled in terms of their wave functional degrees of freedom. In 1966, John Bell, who was on sabbatical from CERN in the States, wrote a very beautiful, very profound review paper of the hidden variable question, in which for the first time he pointed out exactly what was wrong with the von Neumann no-go proof. He found exactly the assumption that was unconvincing. 
in the Nago theorem. He wasn't actually the first. You know, there was a, a German uh, physicist called Greg Harman who, who, who found this first, but somehow her work didn't come to prominence. And I think Bell's work was independent of hers. So that was one of the first things that he did in this review paper of hidden variables. He did a lot of interesting things. But one of the most important things that he did was to show that any hidden variable theory at all that's consistent with the quantum mechanical predictions must have a property that the de Broglie-Bohm theory has. And that property is called contextualism. Okay, what does that mean? Suppose I'm measuring an observable A in quantum mechanics, represented by a self adjoint operator. And suppose observable B is compatible with observable A. In other words, the operators commute. Well, I know in quantum mechanics that if I have two commuting operators, I can measure them simultaneously. But if A is degenerate, it means that there could be another operator B, it's not bigger part than C, that also commutes with A. So A and C could be measured simultaneously. But it turns out that B and C don't commute. So either you measure A and B simultaneously, or you measure A and C simultaneously, but you can't do all three of them together. So suppose I ask the following question in the hidden variable theory. If I have a hidden variable, it allows me to predict what the outcome of the measurement of A is. Of course, the problem is that it's hidden. I can't get my hands on it. But, so these are hypothetical things. So I take the wave function, I take the hidden variable, I can predict what's going to happen to A when I do a measurement on A. Let's say we have a deterministic hidden variable theory. Like the de broglie bohm theory, it's deterministic. But the question is, in that theory, does the prediction depend on whether I'm measuring B simultaneously with A or C simultaneously with A? In other words, does it depend on the experimental context? And what Bell showed, on the basis of a very simple proof, was that it must be contextual. If it's going to be consistent with the structure of observables in quantum mechanics, in other words, with the Hilbert space structure, every hidden variable theory must be contextual. A year later, Koshin and Specker independently proved the same result. It's often called the koshin specker theorem. It should always be called the bell koshin specker theorem, because Bell got it first. Koshin and Specker provided a, a finitist proof, much, much more complicated, but involving a finite number of observables, whereas Bell's proof was very simple, but it involved a continuum of observables. But this is a very, very important theorem in the foundations of quantum mechanics, the Belkoshin Specker theorem. Extremely important. Very important, for example, in quantum information theory and so on. This is one of the really important things that he did. Interestingly, his interpretation and the Cochin and Specker's interpretation of their own theorem are completely different. Bell said, well, <coughs> hidden variable theories are hanging around, but we have the de broglie bohm theory, which he studied very carefully self-consistent, perfectly good theory. Well, it has its idiosyncrasies, which we can perhaps come back to. <clears throat> but if we want to ask ourselves what any conceivable hidden variable theory is like, it's got to have this property of contextualism that the de Broglie-Bohm theory has. It's not an argument against hidden variables. It's just telling you that non-contextual hidden variables are impossible. Koshin and Specker, for their part, thought they were ruling out all hidden variable theories. Because they didn't understand the importance of the consistency of the de broglie bohm theory. So Bell had a much more accurate understanding, a much more careful understanding of this theorem than Koshin and Specker. Now the third thing that Bell did, well he did many things in this paper, the third thing that I want to stress, he asked a very simple question. We know that contextualism in the Bohm theory is now a generic feature of hidden variables. What about non-locality? What about action at a distance? Is that also going to be a characteristic feature of hidden variables? He answered the question two years earlier. 
This is the only case I'm aware of in the history of physics of backwards causation. Well, not quite. The paper that was published in 1966 was actually written in 1964 and was sent to the offices of the Reviews of Modern Physics. And it was somehow lost for two years. In the meantime, he answered his own question. And that was the famous 1964 paper which we'll come on to now. Now, we, in a, to, work, to understand what Bell was doing with the de broglie bond picture in mind, let's go back to the famous einstein podolsky rosen argument of 1935. Einstein was a critic of the Copenhagen interpretation for a number of reasons, but in particular, he was convinced that the wave function could not be a complete description of the quantum system. So how did the argument go? Incidentally, this paper was published famously in 1935. His co-authors were Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen. Um, recently, there have been a number of um, insinuations in the literature that Boris Podolsky may have been a Russian spy during the Second World War and had contact with the KGB. I don't know if this is being definitively established or not, but if you, go, if, you go, if you go to Google, for example, you'll find a reference to this possibility. So this is 1935. This is before, before the, the war. Einstein had been trying to show that if you think that the quantum mechanical description given by the wave function is complete, there's going to be some kind of non-locality in quantum mechanics, just in standard quantum mechanics. Here's a simple way of thinking about it. I take a particle, I pass it through a single slit. So the wave function is now essentially of a sort of hemispherical, suppose you spend, pass it through a hole, you now have a kind of a hemispherical wave function that's emerging out of that hole. Imagine if you had a, hem a hemispherical detector, sensitive at all places on the detector. So the wave, the wave function the wavefront is hitting the detector simultaneously, but famously, notoriously, there's only one electron, and it's going to appear at some point on the screen. This is the famous collapse of the wave function problem, or a version of the measurement problem. How does the wave-like feature suddenly become corpuscular, localized in the screen? But what Einstein asked himself is the following. Some part of that detector, when it fires, all the other parts of the detector must somehow know not to. How do they know not to? Isn't this a kind of action at a distance? Ah, but it would be different if the wave function was not the complete description, but there was actually a particle going through with a trajectory that ended up on a point on the screen, and that's what made the screen fire at that point rather than at any other point. So now you had a local description, not an action at a distance. But this requires the wave function to be incomplete. There's something else that's causing that definite outcome at some place in the screen. But he thought he would try to make the argument a little even more persuasive by looking at systems and entanglement. So let's consider the case, for example. Now, David Bohm provided a nice spinning version of the original EPR arrangement, which we'll, we'll, we'll discuss now. So we have a source here of two spin a half particles that are moving in opposite directions. And they're entangled. In other words, the total wave function is a linear superposition of spin up. We're, we're picking out a particular direction in space for both of our detectors. So we're looking at the component of spin relative to that direction in space. Same direction on both sides. So the wave function is going to be spin up for the left system times spin down for the right system. A linear combination of that and the opposite. So if you look at this, this particular, this is the so-called singlet state, it's a linear combination of anti-correlated spin states. Anti-correlated. Spin up on one side, spin down the other. Spin down on one side, spin up the other. So we know from ordinary quantum mechanics we're going to get one of these, when we do the measurements, we're going to get one of these outcomes. 
and they're going to be anti-correlated. We just can't predict, for example, whether when the spin system comes into this device, it's going to provide a plus or a minus, up or a down. Can't predict that, because that's only one of the two possibilities in the wave function. But you know that if you get an up here, you're going to get a down here. If you get a down here, you're going to get an up here. That's fixed by the wave function. Now think about it. Suppose you do a measurement on this side. Suppose you do a measurement on this side. You get an up. Immediately you know something about what's going to happen on the other, the other wing of the experiment. Immediately you know that. It's going to be a down. But before you did this experiment here, there was a, a probability, a quantum probability, of getting both a, a down and an up. So it seems as if something physical has changed over here. Before there was, a fight, there was a probability of getting an up and a down, and now there's a probability of getting just down. It looks like something physical has changed over here as a result of doing an experiment here. That's action at a distance, isn't it? Or you might, another way of putting it is, and this is what we often say in naive quantum mechanics, you do an experiment here, you collapse the wave function. So this wave function here collapses down to one of the two components, but that immediately tells you that something has changed over here. So the collapse of the wave function is an action of resistance for entangled systems. That's if the wave function is a complete description. What if it's not a complete description? What if for each pair of particles coming out of the source, there are actually parameters that determine what the spin components are? even if you don't know what they are. So this is the spin analog of having localized point particles in the previous experiment. Well, in that case, you could imagine that everything is local. Because for every pair of particles that comes out, if this guy is up, then this guy is down, and vice versa. And you're just discovering what those were preordained locally when you do the experiments. So Einstein's conclusion was that in order to avoid action at a distance, you have to give up the idea that quantum mechanics is complete. So far, so good? Pretty good argument. Pretty good argument. Which, unfortunately, has been exposed on two, two fronts. And the first was Bell. What Bell did was to introduce, introduce a twist in the argument. He asked himself the following question. What happens if, for example, instead of measuring spin, the component of spin, the same component of spin in both wings of the experiment, what happens if I measure, for example, the component of spin in some arbitrary direction here? Suppose that's spin up in the z direction. Now I'm going to measure spin in some arbitrary direction. Well now, it no longer, it's no longer the case you're going to get perfect correlations. But you are still going to get weaker correlations. They're not going to be uncorrelated. There's a formula in quantum mechanics that tells you what the correlation function is. And it depends on the, the, it depends on the angle that defines the difference between the two orientations of your apparatus. By the way, before I go any further, one thing I want to stress here is this experiment, if you think about it, in ordinary quantum mechanics, you think of the wave function being complete. The outcome over here is random, isn't it? It's intrinsically random. You, you simply cannot predict what you're going to get, whether you're going to get a spin up or a spin down. And this over here is random. Now, how can it be that if I have a random process happening here and a random process happening here, that they're correlated? How can they be random and correlated? By the way, this is a mystery, even if they're not absolutely anti-correlated. Even the weakest correlation is a mystery. If these, if these things that are happening are random, intrinsically random, how can there be any correlation at all? Bear that in mind. So what Bell did was to take this guy, give it a twist, and ask himself, can a local hidden variable theory, 
of the kind that Einstein was interested in. Can it account not just for the case of strong anti-correlations, perfect anti-correlations or correlations, what about in the case of the weaker correlations, when the two orientation of the two spin meters are, are different? What will happen in that case? Well, in one of the most profound results in modern physics, probably the simplest theorem you can imagine, it's very easy to prove, here, here's our spin meter on the left, and we're imagining, for example, that we can set it up and we have two settings, we can measure spin in the direction A or A prime. We can't do them simultaneously because the operators in general won't commute. And then we're looking at a spin meter B and B prime. This is not exactly the way Bell put it in 1964. This is a modern uh, variant, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take um, pairs of spin systems in the spin singlet state, the state we saw before, and we're going to choose, for each run, we're going to choose, let's say, A and B, or A and B prime, because they, they commute, because they live in different Hilbert spaces, different systems. So we can always measure A and B simultaneously, A and B prime simultaneously, or we could randomly choose A prime and B, or A prime and B prime. So we just do these experiments over and over and over again, choosing randomly amongst these four possibilities. And we ask ourselves, what do we get, and when we do these measurements, what do we get by way of a correlation function? Well, it turns out that in this very special case with spin, spin half systems, a very good correlation function is just given by the average value of the products of those spins. Spin in the A direction, spin in the B direction. We can multiply the results, take the mean value, that's a very good measure of the correlation. So what we do is we show that if, here's the catch, this is the one important assumption in the proof, we're going to assume we have a deterministic hidden variable theory, so there's a hidden variable along with the wave function for each pair of systems coming out, and they're going to predict, if you knew what that hidden variable was, you could predict the outcome, say, if we were doing A and B simultaneously, you could predict that outcome and that outcome. Now, we're going to introduce a locality assumption, which is the value you predict for the spin in that direction does not depend on whether you're measuring B or B prime on the distance system. Pretty natural. That's our locality assumption. All you need is the locality assumption, essentially, and what you can prove is that if you take a, this linear combination of these correlation functions, notice the minus sign here, the mean value of that linear combination of correlation functions is bounded by 2. And the proof is very simple. I won't go through it, but it's very, very simple. But it requires this locality assumption. So Bell said, what does quantum mechanics predict? Well, the, this expression here is related to the cosine of the angle between the two spin meters. And it turns out that you can choose these directions in such a way that, don't, that when you take this, the mean value of, these, of this linear combination, you get 2 root 2, which is more than 2. So quantum mechanics predicts a violation of the so-called, well, originally it was called the Bell inequality. This particular version of it came a few years later, and it's due to Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt. Nice, a nice collaboration between physicists and philosophers. The word Clauser here, important figures we'll see in this field. A book was recently written called <coughs> How the Hippies Saved Physics, David Kaiser. <clears throat> and he's referring to the fact that in the, se in, the, in the 70s, the late 60s, early 70s, there were physicists who didn't have permanent jobs who got interested in foundations of physics, which was a sort of a, a kind of wacky thing to do. 
somewhat frowned upon, and they were able to come up with some very, very important results, analysis of the foundations of quantum mechanics along the line of non-locality and entanglement and these things. They never ended up getting jobs. Klauser never had a permanent position, as far as I know. It made it incredibly important. So he was one of the hippies in the late 60s, early 70s, who was doing this foundational work in quantum mechanics that nowadays we regard as so important. So, just to repeat, we know that quantum mechanics predicts correlations between spin systems through the singlet state, and it turns out that they are too strong. The correlations are too strong for any local hidden variable theory to predict. Deterministic and local hidden variable theory. So if you like, this is the result that Einstein would least have liked. Because remember what his argument. If quantum mechanics is complete, the wave function is the complete description, it must be non-local. And Bell comes along and says, even if it's incomplete, it's non-local. So the question I'm going to raise at the end of the talk is, does that mean quantum mechanics is non-local, period? Does that mean that quantum mechanics is non-local, period? And then what about relativity? Okay. So this is the nature of the theorem. And from the, from the early 70s onwards, experiments were set up to test for these correlations because it turned out that... <coughs> The strict anti-correlations had been, had been confirmed experimentally, but not, not the weaker correlations. And so experiments were set up, and with, I think, one famous exception, virtually all of the experiments to date have confirmed the quantum mechanical predictions. And now there's scores. I mean, there's, I, I'd be surprised if there's less than 100, if there's, if there's less than 100 results these days. Testing for correlated photons, correlated protons, entangled protons, and so on. This has become a mainstay in quantum information theory, new ways of testing the Bell inequality. So, let's take it for granted that quantum mechanics has given us a resounding no to local hidden variable theories. Okay. So, in 1964, we had... Bell answering the question that he raised in his 1966 paper. In 1971, well, Bell was aware that in the de Broglie Bohm theory, you don't just have a hidden variable associated with the, with the spin systems, you also have hidden variables associated with the instruments, the macroscopic instruments. You should have really taken them into account, so he did a version of the Bell theorem where he used both the hidden variables of the system and the hidden variables of the apparatus. And again, well, I won't go into the details, but something interesting came up. It was, a, it was an inadvertent anticipation of something that came later, which was really in 1976. In 1976, Bell was aware that the argument so far had involved deterministic hidden variable theories. So if you, had a, if you could specify the hidden variable for a system and the wave function, you could then you could in principle predict the outcome of any experiment you were going to do deterministically. And Bell said to himself, do I really need determinism in proving non-locality? What, what if the hidden variable theory is indeterministic? Now you might ask yourself the question, why would you be interested in a hidden variable theory that's the indeterministic rather than the way that quantum mechanics is? If you don't like indeterminism, indeterminacy, if you don't like um, the fact that quantum mechanics is indeterministic, why would you then introduce a hidden variable theory that's likewise indeterministic? But it's a logical possibility. You could imagine a theory that provides some sub-quantum degrees of freedom, parameters, that themselves are, themselves are incomplete, but allow you, only, allow you to make finer-grained probabilistic predictions than quantum mechanics does. Now the question is, can you also show that they must be non-local? And here things get very tricky. Here things get very tricky. How do you define non-locality? Remember before, the claim was, when I do a measurement in the A direction over here, 
the, pre the, the deterministic prediction doesn't depend on what I'm measuring over there. So now I want a probabilistic version of that. But it turns out that a probabilistic version of that is not going to give you a bell inequality. You need something stronger. So I'll go into, I'll go into that in a moment. But in 1976, Bell produced a paper which was really a departure from the early stuff. He's introducing now uh, indeterministic and variable theories. Clauser and Horn had already done this and, and shown how to get a Bell inequality. Bell had picked this up. Maybe, I'm not sure whether he would. He might, I'm sure he was aware of the, the Clauser and Horn paper of 1974 and ran with that and came up with a definition that he called local causality. So he wanted to show that any hidden variable theory that's locally causal, that's indeterministic, will produce a, a Bell-type inequality that will then be violated by quantum mechanics. And so in other words, any hidden variable theory, if it's stochastic, if it's indeterministic, cannot be locally causal. The problem is, how do you define local causality in the case of a probabilistic theory? That's the rub. And it turns out, by the way, that um, quantum mechanics, according to this, we'll see what this definition is, it's automatically not locally causal. Automatically it's not locally causal. <coughs> and now what Bell was doing was he was taking the Bell theorem out of quantum mechanics and just saying, look, suppose I have a stochastic theory in physics, a probabilistic theory, involving measurements of this, roughly this kind of thing. You can have two systems that are separated. They interact with measuring devices. If I impose this condition of local causality, I'm going to end up with a Bell inequality, Bell-type inequality. And then the question is, does nature agree with this or not? Well, then you have to bring in quantum mechanics. But the theorem itself is just a theorem in physics. It's much more general than quantum mechanics. <coughs> And then finally, I mean, there were a number of shifts in his thinking, and I, and I want to say more about this in a minute, but in the year that he died, he published a paper called uh, La Nouvelle Cuisine, and there he expresses serious doubts about this whole program involving probabilistic hidden variable theories. We'll see that in a moment. This is not often picked up in the literature. And furthermore, we're going to take a look at what he thought about the connection with relativity theory. I mean, is relativity theory, is, is the fact that quantum mechanics is locally, is, is not locally causal, is that going to be a problem with relativity theory or not? And this is where the subtleties come in. It's a bit gray, this subject. So let me just go quickly through the 1976 paper. So I was, as I mentioned before, more than ever before in Bell's writings, his theorem stands alone from quantum mechanics. He's just saying... Take a generic probabilistic theory involving pairs of systems which are measuring at a distance, something like that. And he refers to general indeterministic theories satisfying the so-called factorizability condition. I'll come back to that. That's the local causality condition. We would like to form some notion of local causality in theories which are not deterministic, in which the correlations prescribed by the theory for the viables are weaker. Bell introduced this nice word, viable. Because, you know, when you're studying quantum mechanics, you always come across the word observable. Observables are represented by self-adjunct operators in the Hilbert space. What's an observable? Is that, is that an element of reality? Does it require a human agent? What's going on here? Why is it, for example, in standard quantum mechanics, that you see the word measurement or observable appearing in the, in the axioms of the theory, the most fundamental postulates? Surely there's something wrong with that. You don't see that in general relativity. You don't see it in special relativity. You don't see it in Newtonian mechanics. The word measurement should never come as a fundamental term in physics. Bell himself said, you should never use the following words as fundamental. Observable, measurement, system, and, and certain others. I have to tell you a story. I went to a conference in around 18, 1989, in Erechim, in, in Sicily. It was a huge conference. Jeremy, I think you were probably there. I wasn't there, it was 89. 
something like 89, and it was an enormous collection of people working the foundations of quantum mechanics, and John Bell was the key speaker. And, at the, and this was in the days of overhead projectors, where people had you know, written slides, transparent slides with overhead projectors. And the first day of the conference, Bell got up to give the opening address, and he said, I hate certain words in quantum mechanics. System, observable, measurement, they're not fundamental things. Everyone rushed back to their hotels, pulled out their slides, scratched out <laughs> words on all the slides. So for the next week, we saw these slides with words scratched out. <laughs> Bell got up to give the final speech. What did he do? He used the words observable, measurement, system. How can you not? You just have to be self-critical, that's all. Very difficult to give a talk on quantum mechanics without measuring these words. But you have to bear in mind that they're, they're loaded. Good. For the first time, Bell states that ordinary quantum mechanics, even relativistic quantum field theory, is not locally causal. Now, the claim does not depend on his theorem. It does not depend on violation of wealth type inequality. It does not even depend on, on entanglement. You remember this, when I mentioned before, the case of a single slit experiment where the single electron is, its wave front is, its wave packet is emerging with a, with a spherical symmetry, hemispherical symmetry arriving at the screen. The fact that one of these points on the screen fires and all the others are, are, are silent is a violation of what he calls local causality. Where's the, where's the uh, entanglement here? So local, quantum mechanics is clearly lo not locally causal, for d given this particular definition, which we'll see in a moment. It's got nothing to do with his theorem. His theorem has to do with hidden variable theories. Now, here's another complication. When Bell applies this theorem to quantum mechanics, in the, it's in the context of a, of a putative, locally causal, indeterministic, hidden variable completion of the theory, but there's no more mention of EPR correlations. Now, here's the rub. The condition that he uses, the so-called factorizability condition, which we'll see in a moment, that represents local causality, if you impose that condition, and you still talk about the perfect anti-correlations in the case where the apparatus is a parallel. The existence of perfect anti-correlations causes the theory to be deterministic. So, if you're starting with an indeterministic theory and you impose factorizability, and you still want to have the perfect anti-correlations in those special cases, it collapses down to an indeterministic theory. So what are you going to do? Well, you could say, look, I'm talking about a generic theory. Um, maybe it, it just doesn't, maybe it, it doesn't say anything about the case of the perfect anti-correlations when I'm measuring parallel spin components. Or you might say, in my theory, um, the predictions in the case of the perfect, in the case of the perfectly parallel detectors, is only well defined up to the experimental accuracy of these things. Something like that. So somehow, it's as if there's an awkwardness here. You want to have an indeterministic theory that, that satisfies local causality, but it remains indeterministic. So somehow you have to put the perfect anti-correlations aside for the moment. There's an awkwardness here. Now, here's one, one other important thing. Bell was one of the first in the literature he wasn't the first. In fact, David Bohm was in 1950, 1951. When we're talking about action at a distance, the following question arises. Can I make a bell telephone? Can I use that action at a distance to send signals superluminally? And the answer is no. And that's very simple, because in quantum mechanics, when you calculate probabilities in the case of entangled systems using the so-called Born rule, the standard probabilistic rule, it turns out 
that the probabilities for any experiment you're doing, any measurement you're doing on one system, do not depend on what you're doing on the other. So there may be at the subquantum level all kinds of action and distance between these things, but at the statistical level, it all gets washed out. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. So it starts to make, there's a so-called no signaling theorem in quantum mechanics. So it starts to make the action at a distance look a little bit conspiratorial, it's hidden. The minute you look at the statistical out predictions, you lose any, any sign of this action at a distance. So now the question arises, well, does that make the theory somehow better, more consistent with relativity? Well, it depends on what you mean by special relativity. But this is an interesting issue. <clears throat> And Bell himself was aware, he, originally in 1964, he said, look, there's a clear violation of Lorentz covariance in deterministic and variable theories, but then he had second thoughts, because we, he was aware of the no-signaling theorem, one of the first to be aware of it in the literature. And the, the waters became muddy. The relationship with special relativity. Well, I've already basically said what happened to the EPR. Um, how much time do I have? I think I'm going to skip, unless people want to go through this in the question, I'm going to skip the, the precise definition of the factorizability condition. But it essentially says, if you have a stochastic theory and you're looking at, you're looking at measurements in this region of space-time, and corresponding measurements in this region of space-time between systems that have had some common past, maybe they've been entangled or something. The idea of local causality essentially is that once you've specified all the information in the past light cone of this guy, all the predictions, the probabilistic predictions for anything happening here are not going to depend on what's going on over there. So there are going to be no correlations at the level of the deepest level of the hidden variables. If, if these regions of space like separated in relativistic terms, so you don't expect any, any interaction must be superluminal, so you rule that out, you're going to say that there should be no correlations. Okay. Well, quantum mechanics obviously denies this, standard quantum mechanics, because there are correlations in quantum mechanics. So the question is, should there be correlations at the level of the hidden variables? And if there are such correlations, it turns out, I beg your pardon, if there are no such correlations, it turns out that you can derive a Bell inequality. I mean, there are subtleties here that I don't have, really, I don't have time to go through, but I can come back to this in, in, in the discussion if necessary. The thing that I want to stress at the moment is, what is the connection with relativity theory? So is non-locality in hidden variable theories consistent with special relativity or not? That's the question. Here's 1964. In a theory in which parameters are added to quantum mechanics, in other words, hidden variables, to determine the results of individual measurements without changing the statistical predictions, there must be a mechanism whereby the setting of one measurement device can influence the reading of another instrument. That's the non-locality that he proved. However remote. Moreover, the signal involved must propagate instantaneously, so, so that the theory can, the, such a theory cannot be Lorentz invariant. That's a pretty clear statement that, that the theory is going to be inconsistent with special relativity, because what is the fundamental principle of special relativity? That the dynamics in the theory, the fundamental equation is the Lorentz covariant. I mean, what else is special relativity? But, then there's the no signaling theory. So in 1976, he recognizes the no signaling theorem in quantum mechanics, and he's now he's a bit doubtful what's going on. In 1984, he says, mm, I think it's still the case that there's a problem. He says, for me, then, this is the real problem in quantum theory. The apparently essential, the apparently essential conflict between any sharp formulation and fundamental relativity. That is to say, we have an apparent incompatibility at the deepest level between the two fundamental pillars of contemporary theory. So here he's thinking of a, of a, um, 
a non-local hidden variable theory and special relativity. There seems to be a clash. But then, in 1986, hmm, let me read this to you. I would say that the cheapest resolution is something like going back to relativity as it was before Einstein. When people like Lorentz and Poincaré thought that there was an ether, a preferred frame of reference, but that our measuring instruments were distorted by motion in such a way that we could not detect motion through the ether. Now, in that way, you can imagine that there is a preferred frame of reference, and in this preferred frame of reference, things do go faster than light. Behind the apparent Lorentz invariance of the phenomena, there is a deeper level which is not Lorentz invariant. This pre-Einstein position of Lorentz and Poincaré, Larmor and Fitzgerald, is perfectly coherent and not inconsistent with special relativity. So the, 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 the idea here is, well, we have the sub-quantum level of hidden variables, and all kinds of mad things are happening there, superluminal communication and so on, but at the statistical, the observable, the phenomenological level, which we can actually control, these variables, we don't seem to have a violation of Lorentz covariance. So, what do you conclude? Do we have a, a conflict with special relativity or not? How do you define special relativity? The fundamental equations have to be Lorentz covariant, but what are the fundamental equations? Are they the equations that hold even at the sub-quantum level that you can't control? And then, in his final paper, 1990, this further critical discussion of the no-signaling theorem, and there is no categorical statement of a violation of special relativity. Do we then have to fall back on no-signaling faster than light as the expression of the fundamental causal structure of contemporary theoretical physics, as well? In other words, is the no-signaling theorem the final word here? But then he says, this is hard for me to accept. For one thing, we have lost the idea that correlations can be explained. Or at least this idea awaits reformulation. So what he's saying is, if we have an indeterministic and variable theory, we've got to allow for correlations, even at the, the sub-quantum level. Because if we don't, we're going to end, end up with an inequality that's violated by quantum mechanics. What is causing the correlations? What's the answer to that? What is causing the correlations? Normally, when we talk about events that are correlated, either one is causing the other, or the first is causing the second, or they've interacted in the past. They have a common origin in the past. Well, what's the analog in quantum mechanics? Well, some of us think entanglement. We have an entangled wave function. You only have to look at it to see that something funny is going on. Because you can't say that the properties of this system and the properties of that system describe the total properties of both systems. That's exactly what entanglement denies. An entangled wave function says that this system and that system have states, if they have states, which themselves don't determine the state of the whole system. The state of the whole system cannot be written as a product of individual subsystem states. And if the wave function has something to do with the story, then it's not only that it's surprising that there are correlations at all levels. Is that the right way of thinking about it? You see, I'm, I'm raising more questions than I'm answering. Now finally, well, I know time is short and I must finish. So, I was going to say, the Bell himself in his last, very last paper, says, look, I've given this definition of local causality, it must be treated with utmost caution. Utmost caution. Because I have a notion of, of causality, that this thing shouldn't be causing that across space-like separations at the hidden variable level. But what's a cause? You ever seen the word cause appear in an equation? So somehow you have to take this intuition of cause, which is vague, and turn it into something that's in an equation, and you do that by using the circle factorizability condition. No correlations. And he says, well, maybe I've thrown the, the baby out with the bathwater. 
Is that the right expression for this, this causal intuition? Caution, he says. Now, most of the textbooks on, on the, Bell, the Bell theorem, when it comes to the indeterministic and variable theories, do not show any caution. So, this is just a sort of a warning. So, the final thing is, is quantum mechanics non-local? Well, according to the EPR argument, if it's complete, it's non-local. According to the Bell argument, if it's incomplete, if it's deterministic, it's certainly non-local. There's action at a distance. And if it's, if it's stochastic, if it's indeterministic, well, hmm, it's not so clear that there's action at a distance, but there are correlations that need some kind of explanation. And then there's a further question about whether all of this is consistent with special relativity. But you might say, look, if I take quantum mechanics to be complete, a la the Copenhagen interpretation, I get action at a distance. If I go to hidden variables, I get something like, something close to action at a distance. So quantum mechanics is not local. Except that there's one interpretation, which is local. It has no action at a distance. Anyone know what that is? Just one. There's one interpretation that has no action at a distance. Many worlds. Many worlds. Everett. And the reason that it gets around these things, and it, particularly in the case of the EPR result, is because when you're thinking about the EPR case, <coughs> you're always assuming that there's only one outcome when you do a measurement. What if there are two? What if when you do a measurement, you get both spin up and spin down, which is what, exactly what the wave function predicts? Well, then the EPR for, for, for non-locality collapses. And again, you can show that even in the case of the non-parallel spin measurements, in the case of the, in the, case of the many worlds picture, likewise, you don't get non-locality. You still are faced with this problem that there are these correlations. But some of us think, for example, that maybe that can be accounted for simply by the fact that the wave functions are entangled themselves. So, I've seen, I, I can't count the number of times that I've seen in the literature that the Bell theorem tells us that quantum mechanics is non-local. But we have to bear in mind that that's not strictly true. You may not like the many worlds interpretation. You might find it extremely unattractive. But from a purely logical point of view, it is a counterexample to the claim the quantum mechanics necessarily involves action at a distance. Thanks very much.